People know my love for the Philippines and the Filipino people. It's well known. Um, amazing to me how devoted they are. And I have been blessed to be able to visit uh, this Catholic country several times. Now, let's watch a brief video about what Divine Mercy Sunday looks like at our shrine in the Philippines. To say the Philippines is on fire for Divine Mercy would be an understatement. One need only look at our sprawling Divine Mercy Shrine in El Salvador City, with its towering 50-foot-tall statue of the Merciful Jesus, chapels, and facilities for retreats and seminars. The area, known as Divine Mercy Hills, is a major pilgrimage destination. On a typical Divine Mercy Sunday before the pandemic, the weekend would welcome tens of thousands of pilgrims, offer eight masses, and confessions from six in the morning until midnight. It is said that Divine Mercy gained a foothold in the Philippines thanks to the Marian Fathers, who printed simple prayer cards and distributed them to American servicemen during World War II. As they passed through the Philippines, they passed on the cards, and the rest, as they say, is history. The Marian Fathers' mission began in 2008, spurred by the beatification of our founder, St. Stanislaus Papchinsky. This was the sign we needed to accept the invitation by church officials to establish our congregation in the Philippines. Today, five Marian priests and two brothers serve in parishes where they promote the message of Divine Mercy and Mary Immaculate, with particular attention to families. The devotion to Divine Mercy is strong, with the three o'clock chaplet broadcast on radio and television throughout the country. Vocations are a priority with the new formation house for seminarians. Our Marian fathers also participate in works of mercy and charity, especially to victims of natural disasters. Well, Father Derek, we're in Mother of Divine Mercy Village. Can you tell us about the village and how it got started? Okay, so the village is the fruit of the good-hearted people from different parts of the world. And this is also the after Typhoon Sendong in 2011, December, affected many people, killed more than 1,000. And thousands, thousands, they lost their houses. No? So this is why we're following them, helping them in the city tents, in the bamboo amakan houses and then finally we were able to buy the 7.2 hectare and that's about 18 acres uh, and we are able to build 547 houses wow so how many people live here now uh, more or less four or five thousand people now lives here wow. wow and what have you done through the years for the folks here in the beginning, we were simply helping to build, to construct this. This was like uh, very expensive and, and difficult. In the time now of the COVID, they need also some money for the online class. Then for the high school and elementary, it's mostly about the uh, school supplies no? to, to support them. Yeah. Uh, the poorest of the poor. Yes. Then we do also livelihood program, helping people to have some income, especially the big families, poor. Uh, during the COVID, the different kind of uh, lockdowns happened here. So we also were like bringing the rice, food, cans, food that the people can survive because many of them couldn't move, couldn't travel. So we were helping them to, to survive this difficult time. But also we fixed the, the water because there was uh, uh, the well, but was somehow destroyed. And before last year, they only had like one hour per day water. We were able to renovate, uh, put the new pump, new pipes, new wiring, new, new motor. And now the people, each household has 24 hours per day water, which wow, is very beautiful. big benefit, yes. Big. Now, what about spiritually? What are you? Yes, this works of mercy, deeds of mercy, open the people for, for the spiritual dimension of life and sacraments. No? So since last year we have 500 years anniversary of Christianity in the Philippines, we're able to baptize more or less 70 adults who were, uh, some of them very old, like 70 plus. No? Mm. So we were able to baptize them. Then confirmation for these young people, they can see also there, more than, almost 200 young people, uh, baptists of young, small children. Uh, we prepare around 20 couples who for many years live in without sacraments. So we are able to prepare them for the sacrament of 
uh, marriage. Then we have also Confraternity of Immaculate Conception, almost 100 people participating. Many recollections for the youth, for the, for the young people. So they are very open, very uh, responding to, to any right. initiative and action. Right. And finally, a, a hope for the future, a chapel. Yes, because we have the space. Until now, we have liturgy only in this multi-purpose building, which is kind of bodega-style uh, storage. Uh, and we would like to have nice space for the for the chapel. No, yeah. we have space, but not yet building. So we pray and and we also hope for some benefactors. Well, we'll pray for that. And uh, thank you for all you do in Divine Mer Mother of Divine Mercy Village. Thank you very much, Father. Hi, I'm Hazel. I am one of the scholars here in Mother of Divine Mercy Foundation. I am so grateful to be part of this program because it helps me a lot in my schools and also to fulfill my dreams to my family and to myself. Wow, the spirit of the Filipino people continues to amaze me and so many around the world. Now, Father James Cervantes, a Filipino-American ordained to the Marians in 2011, now works in Davao City on the southernmost island. And he says the message of divine mercy resonates with the Filipino people, especially those who are poor. Uh, many have no jobs and are living day to day, but divine mercy touches their hearts. Uh, now, Father Cervantes joins us now, and we're glad to have him. So, Father, tell us about the Divine Mercy Shrine uh, there in the Philippines, especially on Divine Mercy Sunday. Oh, yeah. So, Divine Mercy Sunday, actually, you can call it Divine Mercy Weekend. And so, people start gathering, even coming to the shrine like Thursday, Thursday evening, they start coming for confession. And then Friday is when they a lot of people start coming. They spend overnight, they will bring their tents, and they basically will spend the whole weekend at the Shrine of Divine Mercy. They will sleep there, and they bring their own food, and they will they will line up for confession. And so you, you already have this like uh, build up, the, the crowd is getting bigger and bigger. And then uh, Sunday morning, the, the first mass is like 4.30, there's, a, there's, actually, there's actually a procession before that, so 3 a.m. There's a procession, and then you have like a crowd of like 20,000, maybe 30, even 30,000 people and the field altar uh, celebrating the first mass uh, on the morning of Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, so it's, it's quite amazing. It's an amazing um, experience because people are just, wherever you find a place, there's people just uh, either sleeping there, sitting there, you know. And so, it, yeah, before the pandemic, it was super crowded. Yeah, and the statue of the merciful Jesus that you guys have there is incredible. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yes, the statue is uh, 50 feet tall, and it's probably the only statue in the world where you can actually walk up the steps going to the heart of Jesus. And then inside the heart, the, the Blessed Sacrament is exposed. So you can imagine going up the steps, you know, and it's a, kind of a slow and climb because people when they get up to the heart they actually there's a kneeler to pray so you're you're preparing yourself to meet our lord and then you when you get up there you're in the heart of jesus and you're in front of jesus himself the blessed sacrament and so it becomes a really beautiful encounter with the lord uh, just to meet him and uh, spend time with him uh, and then right after when they come down the steps uh if you look towards the church there's lines of confession. So, so many times people will just go to the confession. They, they see a line there. They say they feel touched and uh, they make a good confession. So it's a, it's a beautiful experience. Well, very good, Father. Now, I hear that our founder, St. Stanislaus Papchinski, has become enormously popular in the Philippines and for an unexpected reason. How's that? Uh, yes. The, you know, when we... We started working in the shrine. Uh, of course, we went to the Philippines in Thanksgiving for the beatification of uh, our father founder, Stanislaus. And so one of our priests felt inspired to make a, a novena. Uh, it's like a prayer pamphlet. And, and then we started to distribute them after the mass, inviting people to, to pray for the, to, stay, to it was at the time, uh, Blessed Stanislaus. 
pray for his intercession and perhaps maybe there would be a miracle and then you know, maybe a uh, cause for canonization. So we weren't sure how, if, uh, you know, how St. Stanislaus would intercede. And then slowly, you know, people started to come back and I said, Father, thank you for this novena, you know, because we couldn't have a child for five years and we prayed the novena and now my wife is pregnant. Um, and so we're like, okay, praise the Lord. And then so, you know, a few weeks later, another couple would come. And it, so there became story after story. Of, and then we started to share this. And so more people asked for the novena. You know, they started asking for this novena. And then so, Saint, you know, at the time, Blessed Stanislaus started to become known as the saint for, for pro-life, for helping couples who cannot have children. Well, Father, that's a powerful testimony and a great story, especially on the anniversary of our founding. Thank you so much for sharing it and for being with us. 